Success. If someone says success, how do you picture that? How do we know what it is? Because probably it means something different for every and each of us. Uh, I have had the fortune to travel around the world and work with very successful people, so to speak. And maybe that's external, or is it internal? Uh, some of them have been fighting pilots, some people have been opera singers, CEOs around the world, or top athletes are doing extremely performances. My question was, can you sort of copy success? Is it something that is in your DNA, or is it a common denominator that all of us could model to sort of get the, the recipe? And uh, when I start to lit, uh, figure out literature in leadership and coaching, I noticed that the model was the same all over the world. And it actually looked like this. You always have one vector that was called time. It's about time. And the other one was about results. And if you were going to draw a line and you were going to draw success, how would it look like? What I figured, and I don't know if you agree, but most people draw a line like that. In other words, that's the way success looks like. And I started to, to do leadership around the world. I noticed that's not the way it looks like. Because I started to notice how people move their hands. And I studied body language and I saw in Korea, Bangladesh, in the US and in Norway, they did the same thing. Everybody was moving their hands like this. So I started to model and I, when I started speaking, hi, my name is Shell. I work with leadership and personal development and I noticed no one noticed. And then I did the opposite and I said, hi, my name is Shell and, and I do leadership and I'm very successful and everybody was sitting like, yeah, I'm very successful, you know. And, so then I said, maybe that's the way success looks like. And what's the components if you move your hand? And I sort of draw that one instead. And I said, if it looks like that, what's the components? What is leadership all about? And that's leadership in myself. It's in my family or with my friends or in a big, huge company. So I started to sort of step out, what's the components? And one is called reality. When we talk about time, it's now, right here. It's the now. And if you were pleased, I bet you wouldn't be sitting here, because if everybody's mindful and here we are, we wouldn't do anything. So the human nature, correct me if I'm wrong, we create a desire, a desired outcome. We want more of the good stuff and less of the bad stuff, and that starts the journey. And here we are, and we have to do something in, in action to close the gap. So what we do is that we either, you know, start to do something to close the gap, and sometimes it works, sometimes not, and if it doesn't, we have to go down in problems. And when we are in problems, we need resources to go to action again, and over and over and over again, and here we are. So what happened was, that when I started to study this, is how do you define the now? How do you analyze that? And most people don't have a desired outcome. When I said, what do you want? Most people couldn't answer that one. So the, the, the outcome has the what factor. What do you want? How do you know you have an exit, that you have reached what you want? Where are you going and why? What's the motivation part? In other words, if you don't, you're just leaving the now. And maybe because it's so bad, that's called threat evasion. I don't want this, this is motivation. So how clear are we on the outcome? How clear are we on the action? If it doesn't work, what do we do? What procedures do we have? What options do we have if it doesn't work? And here we are going, and in the problems, when we are here, how many people are in the hamster wheel running around? What resources do we need to, in order to get out? And here we are. And the last part that was missing was actually the fun part. That was the follow up now. We have to know when to follow up, the, the, the deadline, so to speak. If you make an acronym out of this, it's the NOPRA fund model. How does it work? Well, I don't know about you. But when I started to look to the Swedish sort of population, I said, when do most people in Sweden get the desired outcome? It's called New Year's Eve. <laughs> the more alcohol in, the more we're out. And here you could hear, and they sort of saw, for a fraction of a second, they saw the desired outcome, and they started to talk about Beach 2057. <laughs> and they started the journey here. And then everything falls down by gravity, even inspiration falls down, and then you come down in problems. And here's my question to you. If you ever come down in problem, where does your attention go? I think what's the inclination to go back and say, it was better before when I could eat what I wanted? Why? Because we are negative, I don't think so. Because that's a real experience in the past. And that is why we go back to old behavior, instead of an outcome 
is a fantasy in the future. That means we are fighting with ourselves with the future. We need to make the future more attractive than the past, which means we are fighting with the mind and emotions. So my question to you is, how do we make the emotions, the outcome, more attractive than the past? So we continue the journey. So when I started to work and saw that I started to work with people in jail, I started to work with people who said, you know, I don't know if I want to live anymore. I started to see what's the difference that makes the difference in the outcome. And it came down to pictures. Because the pictures fed emotions. And I don't know about you, but it's like a, a remote control in TV. And I started to work with their pictures in their head. And this is like a remote control. What happens with your emotions if you look to your internal picture that you have your fantasy in the future? If the picture is still or moving, will that influence your emotion? If you p make the picture very sort of uh, small or large, or if you make the picture in color or black and white, or if you make it, you see yourself inside the picture or if you see yourself outside. And these were four basic things that we started to elaborate in pictures in their minds when they saw the outcome in the future. And they said, wow, this is where I want to go. So I don't know about you when you can use this, but it's an interesting. One of the uh, ladies intern in the jail, uh, they said she has a catastrophe uh, way of, of thinking about everything. And we talked about her and she came up. And, and this man in the jail said, this is the lady who has very much catastrophe feeling emotions all the time. And I said, hi, my name is Shell. And, and I said, how do you do it? How do you make a catastrophe of everything? And she says, I don't know. <laughs> and if you look to my hands and I do it without sound, is that a big picture or small? Just by moving the hand. And I guessed it was a big picture. So I said, I don't know. But if, if you try and just take in your hands, make the picture still, make it black and white, Move the way, what happens in you? And she stood totally still and said, wow, I feel still. I said, don't trust me, do it again. Catastrophe. And she did this. I said, wow, and here you go. That's one way of working what happens in your mind. And now you say, well, that sounds good. But what happens when we are really stuck in the problem? How do you do it? I think we model our parents in order to learn, and I model much more than I want to agree. My father was uh, working with cars. He loves competition. I don't know if you have grew up in a family when someone is always competing and always want to beat the shit out of you. Have you ever, yes, I drive fast. <laughs> That's what my father, and he drove very fast and always wanted to beat records. So I believed driving car equals beat a record. Uh, when I grew up and had my own family, three kids and my wife Lotta beside, I always tried to beat records. And uh, particularly one time, we went away and I had the time. I knew it was going to take t uh, two hours, ten minutes, and I loved that. Because if I come to that place two hours, nine minutes, I'm happy the whole summer. I don't know why, I just imitated my father. <laughs> and what happened was that we, we, you know, I clock and we go away. After a couple of minutes, we come to the closest city, and my oldest daughter, Victoria, at that time, seven years old, said, Dad! And I said, yeah. And she goes, Kevin, have an ice cream. And I checked my watch, and it just came out. I, you know, it was not connected. It just came out. No! And I just continued to drive. <laughs> Good atmosphere gone. <laughs> and, and what happened was, after a while, she, she come back with the same happy tonality and said, OK, Dad, now we know we cannot have an ice cream. But if we could have one, which particular type could we have? <laughs> and I got these pictures in my head of different types of ice cream. Chocolate, strawberry, and I love ice cream. So I stopped, bought ice cream, went up to my wife and said, what is she doing? I said, no, and it always becomes a yes. <laughs> She's manipulating with me. So my mind started to draw this in, in my head, and I call this the ice cream boomerang. Boomerang is the native in Australia, and it has three components. And if you have children or know someone, you know what they do. They start always to repeat the first. I know we cannot have an ice cream. What do you think happens when you listen very well? If I am as a father, I let my guard down and say, oh, you have listened. And if you're chilling, you know what they do. They go, Phew. but if, and I love that question, but if we could have one, where is she now? Outcome. Children very seldom lose track of what they want. It's called sales. <laughs> I know we cannot have an ice cream, but if we could have one, 
which particular type could we have? I love that question. So I waited the whole summer because I noticed you have done that for several years, manipulating with me. And the dame came and it was raining outside and she, you know, the whole gang said, oh, it's so boring, we have nothing to do, it's raining. And I said, I know it's raining and so boring and you have nothing to do. But if it was sunny, what would you do? And they said, what? We don't know. And I said, I know you don't know, but if you knew. <laughs> then they said, you are so positive. Then it was my fault it was raining. And I said, I know I'm so positive. If I were negative, how would you like me to be? <laughs> and this is a good tool in the world for yourself in your personal development and your leadership. When people come up and say, oh, it's chaotic right now, you can always listen and say, I know it's chaotic. What resources do you need to solve it? I know it's a problem right now. How would you like it to be? What do you want to see, hear, or feel? Everything is a problem. I hear everything is a problem. May I ask, what can you do? What procedures or what options do you have? You can always go around in the NOPRA fund model. And uh, in this way, I had a phone call many years ago of a guy who had been the best in the world in golf. And he, he called me up and said, would you mind work with me? And I went over to the States, came straight from the airport out to the driving ranch, and he stood and hit him balls. He had been very good, the top in the world. And all of a sudden, he couldn't perform for several years. And my thinking in the NOPRA fund model is in the now, and the outcome, problem, resources, action, or follow-up. I guessed he had been focusing on problems for a long time. If you focus on problems, you get problems. I needed to shift him to resources and outcome. So when he was st standing and hitting balls, my job is to find what's the difference that makes the difference. And what I'm looking for is first balance. If the balance is off, then everything comes off and you compensate with technique. And he knows that. I check his pupils, his breathing, everything. So after a while, he says, do you see what it is? And I said, no. And he continued to hit some more balls and he said, do you see what it is now? And I said, no. And I think he got irritated after a while. He says, don't you see what it is? And I said, no. Every shot, it's very similar. No one is worse, no one is better. And I said, maybe you, you know, no. So what do you think it is? And then he goes, don't you see how short I'm hitting? This is the longest course with the longest holes, and I'm hitting short. If you were his coach, how would you respond to that? Should I agree and say, yeah, very short. <laughs> you just won the gold medal in short. Should I agree? <laughs> so I can't do that. Should I go get, say, no, I think you hit very far compared to my grandmother. I mean, how should I, <laughs> how, how do I respond? That, here, I have to help him to help himself, so I don't victimize him. So I say, I hear you say, you hit short. May I ask you, who hits far? And when I say, who hits far, that's resources, far is the outcome. He just looks at me and said, who hits far? And I say, yeah, and he goes, Tiger Woods. And I said, I know you're not Tiger Woods, but if you were, <laughs> how would you hit it? And he responded immediately with his body, because he has been sloped shoulders, Tiger Woods has very sort of standing erected. So when I said, I know you're not Tiger Woods, but if you were, how would you do it? So he responds, stands up, and then said, if I were Tiger Woods, if I were Tiger Woods, <laughs> then I would hit it like this. And ball, 20 yards further. He just stood and looked at it, and then he goes, but that's not me. <laughs> and then he started to laugh and, and played a tournament, when it was a tough shot, he said, how would Tiger Woods do? And sort of imitated him and played well. He came top 10 in that tournament, it was back. And the Swedish guy, his name is Jesper Ponevi, came up to me after a while and said, what did you do with that guy? I didn't even qualify. I, don't, I didn't know how to respond to him and said, should I say, he thinks he's Tiger Woods, you know what I mean? <laughs> but, but I think that's, that's what we can do sometimes when we are stuck in problems. Who would succeed? And for a fraction of a second we could say, I'm not, I know I'm not her, I'm not him, but if I would, how would I do it? What resources do I need? So here we are, and uh, long story short, I, I, I coached a, a golf gang once and they were supposed to be the best in the world. They weren't at that time, they were ranked number 24, and in six years they would be the best. And when I, you know, used this model, what resources did they need? And I said, focus on the, uh, on the resources, what you're doing good, well, but it didn't help. 
It was one thing that was left all the time, and that was fear. Um, we're going to play the world championship, and one of the girls stood like this. And all of a sudden, she was going to hit over a huge pond. She stepped to the side, so she went like this, boom, 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 and hit to the side. And I asked, excuse me, may I ask you, if you knew you couldn't miss, how would you hit the shot? And she said, what? If I, if I couldn't miss the shot, how would I hit it? And I said, yeah. And she said, I would go straight for the flag. And I said, why don't you? And then she goes, I don't know. I'm not afraid of the water. And she stood and talked to herself and said, but if I hit in the water, it comes up, I feel as a failure. And I don't know what to do with that feeling. And that's called anxiety. That is when you're afraid of, afraid of fear. So I said, I had to find a way to sort of handle this fear. And I asked at that time the best cross-country skier in Sweden. And I asked him, we were sitting at home, and I said, excuse me, may I ask a question? When you're failing, how do you do it? And this is the best answer I ever got. He leaned forward in the kitchen and said, what? And that's the best answer I got. <laughs> he did not want to take the word failing in his mouth. And I said, come on, you understand what I'm saying? He said, no. So we come to the point where he talked about learning. A problem was a potential resource. And he loved his problems, his weaknesses, because that was the only place he could improve. And from that on, all the girls in the national team could always say, I haven't learned yet. I haven't learned yet. Never talking about failing. So if my daughter said, said Dad, you don't listen to me, I don't explain. I say, I haven't learned yet. Please help me. If someone comes up to you and says, you are so bad, you could always say, I haven't learned yet. <laughs> and if you say, but you have been working here for 13 years, you say, I learned slowly. <laughs> so what have you been talking about is the not profound model. If it doesn't work, you could always ask an ice cream boomerang. And I don't know when you're going to ask it yourself in your own life or asking other people. You're not allowed to manipulate in your environment when you come home. I know you don't want to have sex, but if you want to, that's not uh, allowed. You know, it's <laughs> the most important part in leadership and in life is to have fun. But life is the way it is. It's right now. And it's not always it's fun, but from now on you know what you can say. I know it's not fun, but if it were. <laughs> Thank you very much, and good luck in the future.